everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of Bagels and Locks. Uh, Brandon's a little busy again this week, so it's just going to be me. If you're sick of my voice from last week, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to bear with me here. Uh, got a pretty full episode this week for you guys. We're talking about the NBA playoffs, uh, the boycott that started in NBA and moved across a lot of the different sports. Um, in addition to that, we are talking some fantasy football news, and lastly, some trades that have gone on in the world of baseball that will have some big impacts come time for the postseason. So, first off, um, we'll start off with the NBA boycott that started last week when uh, the Milwaukee Bucks decided they were not going to take the floor against the Orlando Magic to close out the series and move on to the next round. So um, personally, I thought that this was a great thing. Um, And I know there's a lot of people out there that are making the argument that, you know, what is sitting out one game really do and that this really didn't do anything at all. And personally, I would have to wholeheartedly disagree with those people. Um, For starters, every NBA stadium is now voting site for the election come November. And that's a pretty big deal because you just opened up um, how many NBA teams are there? 30, 32 more um, voting sites, polling sites um, that people know about. And, you know, I'm sure that they're all going to see voters come out and have a good voter turnout at all those locations. And just that alone could um, impact the election come November. In addition, there's a new coalition formed between owners, players, and coaches. So all three parts that go into the league uh, to help fight for social justice and how they plan to best tackle these types of issues going forward. Um, And it also got a lot of people talking about, Jacob Blake and what's going on in the country around the world really these days and it started in the NBA but you know moved on pretty much across every single sport and this definitely made the conversation come up um, with a lot of people and got a lot of people talking about it and more informed on what happened and I think just those three things alone that's some pretty powerful action that was taken just simply because there wasn't a playoff game played that day between the Bucks and the Magic. Um, now let's let's say you still think that's not enough and that it didn't change anything. Um, I mean, don't these people still have the right to you know fight for the betterment of themselves and their family and their children and all of those types of things? I mean, that's that's pretty important. And that's one of the things that, you know, living in America, we have the opportunity to do is to fight for what you think is right, as long as you do it peacefully. And um, they definitely took that route. And, you know, what, what are they supposed to do? Just accept reality the way it is and not try and make the world a better place. I mean, I think that's kind of a pretty bad view to have on this. And, um, that's, that's why I think this was the right thing to do and it had a positive impact and that's, you know, that, that's my take on it. I don't really think there's too much more to be said on it here. Um, now obviously the games are back in action and stuff, but, um, definitely, definitely started a conversation and made some action happen in our country. I mean, look, look, look at right now you're you're listening to a podcast about it and I'm sure I'm not alone in that matter I'm sure a lot of people have you know been talking about it and that's that's good and that's important it's important to create that that conversation um so we'll get into the sports now um jazz versus nuggets I mean overall probably one of the best playoff series I've ever watched a uh, game just ended a couple minutes ago. You're probably listening to this on Wednesday, September 2nd. Um, what, what an incredible series. I think it just absolutely had to end the way that it did with uh, Donovan Mitchell getting the ball stolen 
and then a layup, you know, missed on the other end for the Nuggets. And then finally a three point opportunity for the Jazz to win the game on the last second to for a buzzer beater of game seven. And it rims in and out and the Nuggets move on. I mean, how else would you guys have liked to see this one end? I mean, it was such a close series back and forth the entire time. And just great to watch from a fan's perspective. We got to see Donovan Mitchell and Jamal Murray just go at it back and forth. And, I mean, it was just beautiful. The first half, I was really worried. Um, I mean, Donovan Mitchell only had seven points, pretty much only had two until the final, like, minute, minute and a half, when she scored five more. Jordan Clarkston was leading the Jazz with 10 points. Rudy Gobert only had one rebound. Nothing made sense. I was kind of fearful that that's the way it was going to look since Denver had all the momentum um, coming back from 3-1. They're the 12th team ever to win a series from down 3-1. But I didn't think it would be that ugly. I mean, 36 points and a half, that's pretty tough for the Utah Jazz. And then um, in the second half, you know, Denver kind of caught the bug where they couldn't score anything. They had a really low scoring half and watching this game kind of reminded me of watching the Detroit Pistons back in the day where we just had that incredible defense and all those low totals um, in the mid, mid two thousands, early two thousands. So that was, um, that was that. And um, it was just sloppy towards the end, but it was, it was a great series all around. We also got to see, um, you know, as I've been saying, you know, Murray, Porter Jr. and Jokic, a little mini big three over there. It's going to be interesting to see how they play against the Clippers next round. But before we get into that matchup, I want to talk about the Los Angeles Lakers for a minute. So Lakers moved on, as I said, guys. Um, I told you so. Um, Wasn't really much to it, especially after Dame got hurt. I mean, they they the Blazers looked pretty defeated. They weren't going to take another game. Um, but, you know, we hope to see him get better soon. The guy was absolutely electric in the bubble. No one could stop him. Um, and the question, you know, I have is, or a lot of people have, is how are the Lakers going to face up against the Thunder or Rockets, depending on who wins that game? Because we have another game seven in the first round coming up on Wednesday, tomorrow, or today, depending on, when you're listening to this, um, which should be super, super exciting. And by the way, I mean, I think the Rockets probably could have got it done last game if Russell Westbrook wasn't touching the ball or handling the ball really for the last few minutes there. I think a lot of you guys out there could probably really agree with that. I mean, he looked just tough and um, that's partially on Dan Tony, because as a coach, you know, you got to get the ball in your best player's hand with the game on the line. And that, that guy is James Harden, especially because Russell Westbrook really has missed a lot of time with this injury. And I mean, we've, we've seen how he is in the clutch over the years and it's just not, not what you want. And I wouldn't be surprised if they lose this series that, you know, Dan Tony may get fired. Um, I mean, you're, you're going up against this OKC team, against the guy you traded away, a team that's, that was supposed to not even make the playoffs. You know, you're not facing LeBron in the first round. You're not facing uh, the Golden State Warriors with Steph Curry. Um, this is a matchup they should have definitely won. And it's, you know, it's coming down to a game seven. Hopefully it can be as exciting of a finish as it was in this Utah versus Denver matchup but we'll have to see. But anyways, back to the topic at hand. Um, For the Lakers, I think the Rockets play a very similar style to the Blazers um, in terms of their three-point shooting and just trying to shoot the lights out of the building. But they they probably do it better than the Blazers do, which led them to having a better record this year. Um, I think, personally, that the Lakers will take advantage of their size and force their will on this Houston team. Uh, it's going to be crucial, guys, for KCP, Danny Green, Caruso, Kuzma, Morris, all these guys to hit their open threes in this series for the Lakers because um, when the Rockets are hot, I mean, they're hot and nothing can really stop them. Uh, so, you know, they might have gotten by a little bit with some sloppy play 
last series and, I mean, even dropped a game because their shooting was so bad. Uh, but they're going to have to be on point against the Houston Rockets. Um, but I think that the Lakers obviously should be able to get it done as the one seed. And, you know, they played less games than the Houston Rockets, so they're, they're going to be a little more rested, or the, the Thunder for that matter. But um, for the Thunder, I, I'm just wondering, you know, who's going to guard LeBron James? Is it Dort? Uh, it's it's going to be a tough matchup there. He should be pretty dominant, and that's if that's the case, I think their big should also dominate the Thunder's bigs, other than Steven Adams. But uh, I expect big quality minutes from Dwight Howard, JaVale McGee, and Morris. Um, they're they're definitely going to need them, and they're going to need to dominate. And I just think the Lakers are a better team overall. But as I said, you know, Thunder weren't even supposed to be in the playoffs. Here they are taking Houston to Game Seven. Um, they're, they're a sneaky team, and people have been counting them out all year. So you, you never know what's going to happen. But I just think the Lakers are playing on a completely different level right now and should take care of either one of these teams. However, I'm really excited for the Game 7, as I said. Um, it's going to be a good one. Um, moving on to the Clippers. They finally got their shit together and slowed down Luka Doncic. I'm not going to say they stopped Luka Doncic because, I mean, he was still putting up triple-double numbers, but made it made it tough for the Mavericks to win, and that that's what they needed to do. I think no Chris stops really hurt them this series because, you know, who knows? It could go seven games if Chris stops actually plays throughout the whole series, and if that happens, I mean, you never know. We just saw what happened – uh, with Utah and Denver coming down to the last shot. So you, you, you really never know when it goes to seven games. Um, even even in the case of this last series, uh, Utah went up 3-1 and Denver still came back and got the job done. Uh, but I, I think that uh, the Mavericks shocked a lot of people by taking this series to six games, man. Um, pretty Pretty impressive stuff from them. Their offense looks great. And overall, I mean, the future is really bright in Dallas, and they're going to be a problem for years to come, especially as Luka matures even more. I mean, it's crazy to think he's 21. Um, and the team, as the team meshes together over time and the shooters get more comfortable and they start clicking more on the defensive end, and, I mean, they close out more games because they had a really hard time this year closing out games in the clutch. Um they could be a very big problem in the Western Conference, and they're all pretty young. So this team could be around for a while. And also, you know, in that last game, Paul George finally came back and stepped it up, um, showing the Clippers that he's the actual player that they traded for, uh, which is, you know, good to see for Paul George. He's having a really tough time out there. Uh, but they're definitely going to need that more from him going forward as it's only going to get harder. Um, they might actually have an easier time with this Denver team than they did with the Mavericks just because the Mavericks offense was so explosive. And as we saw tonight, uh, Denver or both teams really for that matter struggled to score the ball. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you're going to, you're going to have a tough long series if, if they cannot get scoring the way that they have been in the past. And they're also exhausted from playing their hearts out for seven games um, but I think it'll be exciting and a good one to watch for sure. Last but not least, before we move on to the Eastern Conference here, guys, got to talk about Marcus Morris. Uh, in my opinion, who's really surprised by the antics that he had? Um, he's had these types of problems ever since he's been in college at Kansas. Uh, he's just been a nuisance to everyone. He's had, you know, flagrance over the years. It's, it's just not really a shocker to me. Um, he commented on Bleach Report's Instagram, Cry Me a River, after a Luka Doncic quote that talked about him. Uh, he just loves causing beef, loves causing problems. Um, you know, originally in game five, was it, when he stopped on Luka's ankle, just kind of out of nowhere, didn't really even need to happen. He said it was an accident. Then we see him in game six, just totally caused a flagrant foul on Luka. Um, he just loves being, I think he just loves being in the spotlight and loves causing problems. And 
I mean, if you can get a mental edge over the best player on the other team in in your playoff series, that that's huge. Um, and I think it definitely did affect Luca a little bit, at least. Who knows if that was actually the case? But um, yeah, I mean, Marcus Morris, man, and low key, like he can talk all the shit that he wants, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned. Because until the last game where Paul George stepped it up, I think he was probably the second best player for the Clippers behind Kawhi Leonard, both on the offensive and defensive end. I mean, he was putting in work, giving them great quality minutes throughout the entire series um, and just causing problems. So if if he's playing at that level, he can he can talk that shit. But, you know – at a certain point, you might need to get that under control, try and not have any flagrants because, you know, if you're playing this a Lakers team or, you know, perhaps even against this Nuggets team, they're going to need them to put up, uh, stay in the game the entire time. And you know the refs are going to be watching them under a microscope now. Um, so he's going to have to stay a little cool-headed to, to help give Clippers a chance at their title run here. So in the Eastern Conference, we saw Miami versus Milwaukee. What an electric ending to that first game, man. Uh, Jimmy G buckets. The G stands for gets. Not forgets, but for gets. He gets buckets. Doesn't forget about getting buckets, as you guys can see. Uh, absolute killer. Lethal weapon on the game one. Nothing could stop him. Not even Giannis. And I don't know, guys. I feel like Giannis wasn't really taking on the challenge of defending him which really surprised me is he is the defensive player of the year. And that's kind of what you would expect from him. Um, but I mean, nothing could stop Jimmy Butler at the end of that game, whether, you know, I, th I didn't see him take that many jump shots in a long time, uh, whether he was taking threes, taking mid range, driving to the basket. I mean, everywhere on the score in the fourth quarter, he was absolutely lighting him up. But this year, this, the first game overall wasn't all about Jimmy Butler of the whole entire Heat team um, looked really good for the duration of that game. Uh, I mentioned this on last week's episode, uh, the Heat of good length and match up really well against Giannis. You know, I said Bam Abadayo was going to slow Giannis down. Said I said he's not going to be the Giannis stopper, but he's going to slow him down. He's going to make it hard for him. And we saw just that. The Miami Heat swarmed Giannis pretty much every opportunity they could have and this caused a lot of disruption making it really difficult for Giannis I mean he only had 18 points on 12 shots six for 12 with six turnovers um from the MVP and defensive player of the year you you expect more and I expect him to honestly bounce back pretty big in game two perhaps not gonna perhaps he may not look as dominant as he has for the whole season and as he did against the Orlando Magic but I mean he's gonna have more than 18 and probably play a little bit better of a basketball game um but yeah guys who who knows if he's gonna look at his top level all series long I mean I think the Heat are gonna really give him some problems and when Giannis is sitting they play – when Giannis is out and Chris Middleton's in, like pay attention to this, they're playing Chris Middleton like he's Giannis. I mean, they're swarming him. They're making him work really, really hard. And honestly, it, it didn't really slow him down too much. Chris Middleton had 28 points, um, stepped up in a huge way. And Brooke Lopez actually had 24. Um, so, you know, you're getting 28-24 from Middleton and Lopez – but because you only get 18 from Giannis, they end up losing the game to the Heat. And the question is, can Middleton and Lopez be this productive for the course of the series? And how productive is Giannis going to be for the rest of this series? Um, should be super interesting and something that we're going to want to keep our eyes on. Um, Last week, I said that the Heat could win this series. I'm going to stick with my word after watching that game one. Um, but who knows? It's it's going to be a long one. That's for sure. And I'm really excited because now as teams are slowly getting eliminated, we're getting deeper and deeper into the playoffs. These matchups are getting great. Um, moving on, the last series here, 
Boston Celtics versus the Toronto Raptors. So Boston, they simply have Toronto's number and the bubble. The Raptors have lost only three games, and all three of these games have come to the Boston Celtics, which is pretty crazy if you think about it, honestly. Um, Today's game was super close, but Boston still edged out the victory. Uh, Jason Tatum put on a phenomenal performance. I think he had 34 points. Uh, It's great to see him out there, you know, doing what he's capable of from one Jason to another. You know, I just, I love to see it personally. Um, Marcus Smart hit five straight threes in the fourth to help bring Boston back. That was unbelievable. If you haven't, I'm sure you can YouTube it. Uh, So many guys on this Boston team that can kill you. Maybe not as many as with Gordon Hayward, but Similar to the Heat, when someone's having a bad night, the next man is up. I do think the Miami Heat are definitely deeper, though, than this Boston Celtics squad. And, guys, it was so awesome to see Kemba do basically the same move that made him famous in college with the step back by the free throw line to ice the game. Uh, Obviously, we have got to look at it at the other end, but didn't end up making it. Um, But just – just super cool. I mean, you get chills when you see Kemba doing that. And I mean, I kind of feel like I knew he was going to pull off that move. I wonder if whoever, I can't remember who was guarding him, but I wonder if whoever was guarding him was like, is he going to do, like, is he going to Kemba Walker me? Like, is he going to do what made him who he is on me right now? And sure enough, he did it. I mean, that seems to just be his bread and butter. No one can really stop that. But honestly, guys, Boston has really impressed me through the first two games of this series. They absolutely embarrassed Philly. And I thought that was due to Philly's own issues and their kind of implosion, which probably was, you know, partially responsible for that, or if not a big part of that. But this performance against Toronto has really legitimized themselves in the playoffs for me, at least. And, you know, potentially by the way things are looking, obviously super super early in both these series, especially for the Heat and the Bucks. But could we see a Celtics versus Heat Eastern Conference Finals? And how electric would that be? Who do you guys like in that one? Uh, I personally think Jimmy Butler could do a really good job on Jason Tatum and kind of neutralize him to a degree. And that the Heat's three-point shooting is going to be too much, would be too much for Boston in that one. Um and Boston hasn't really had to rely on the long ball so far in the playoffs, uh, especially against Philly or Toronto really yet, even though, as I just said, Marcus Smart hit those five straight threes in a row. Other than that, I mean, they haven't really had to rely on their three-point shooting to, to carry them, at least. And I think, I think that is something that the Heat have that not a lot of other teams left in the playoffs have, especially in the Eastern Conference. So moving on here, guys, it is fantasy football time pretty much. The season is right around the corner, so I know there's a lot of drafts going on right now. A good topic to discuss, so we're going to talk about it a little bit here. I personally have my own draft this weekend. On Saturday, I got the fifth pick, and... The fifth pick's a little bit of a tough situation for anyone in that position. I don't know if anyone out there listening is is in a similar boat, but you can be pretty much certain, at least in my league, that the first four picks are going to be Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Ezekiel Elliott, and Derrick Henry in some order. Um, I'm in a tough spot right now with this Alvin Kamara news and also Dalvin cook is in a similar situation to Kamara. So Kamara has reportedly been in the building, but not practicing the last three uh, practice days they've had, which is findable by the team. Apparently Uh, he really wants to lock in a long-term deal and get paid as he's still on his rookie contract. Currently, Crazy to think about with how productive this guy has been that he's really not making that much money compared to a lot of the other uh, top-tier NFL talent out there. So earlier, Josina Anderson reported that she talked with the team and they're absolutely open to trading Alvin Kamara. So this is kind of when I went into full panic mode here. Had no idea what was going to happen. Um, it's, it's a huge gamble if you take him. And then Rappaport later reported 
uh, that neither Camaro or his agent asked or demanded a trade, and they thought they were actually really close to hammering out an extension. So, uh, and that he'd never threatened to hold out, and he'd been in the building every single day. So, turns out that the reason he wasn't practicing is because of an epidural shot in his back last Thursday. They're taking it slow, want to make sure he's 100% before he gets out there back on the field. They're saying he will practice on Wednesday, September 2nd. And Dalvin Cook is also trying to get an extension So with the Minnesota Vikings because, yet again, he's another super productive running back that is putting up these top-tier numbers that is on his rookie contract. And they were actually very close to getting a deal done, and then they couldn't get anything done. So they were right there and then kind of moved backwards where Alvin Kamara is sort of in the beginning of this process. Um so personally at the number five spot, I've done some mock drafts, um, done a couple taking Clyde Edwards Hilaire at that spot. And let me know what you guys think of him because he's, I don't know, there's just something about a rookie. There's just uncertainty. You just don't know. He's undersized. I mean, I know he's national champion with LSU. He put up crazy numbers there and he's a beast, but I don't know the fifth pick in the draft. I mean, you, you, you do not want to screw up your first round draft pick. Um, it can set you back horribly. I can speak from this from experience. Um, I took Zeke last year when he held out. And then in the second round, I took Antonio Brown, believe it or not. And then all that crazy shit went down. So that was tough. Year before that, I had uh, Odell. It might have not been Odell that year. It might have been two years before that, but he I think it was two years before where he got injured and um was pretty much out for the entire year and if you don't have your first draft pick it it can be just super tough for you to be competitive in just week to week I mean you need a guy that's going to give you consistent points and that's what you're looking for in the first round um but I've also done some draft taking Michael Thomas at five and depending on how your league drafts, it can turn out nicely or very poorly for you and puts you in a really difficult decision in the second round. A lot of the mocks I've done, you have a shot at DeAndre Hopkins, um, Godwin, sometimes Julio Jones has even been there. Um, but this is a year where running backs are just super scarce. It's really hard to take DeAndre Hopkins in that spot and not get a running back until round three. Um, but it's also super hard to pass up on him at that spot because you have, then you have Mike Evans and you have DeAndre Hopkins, which is just an insane combo. So you get put in a really sticky situation. So I know a lot of fantasy owners around that four to six range are really hoping that Dalvin cook and Alvin Kamara can figure it out. Um, That's kind of my spiel there. Uh, Other than that, where do you guys see Mahomes and Lamar Jackson go this year going this year in your max because I've seen him as early as the first round as late as the third even fourth round sometimes do you guys think they're worth that first round pick or that second round pick or where, where do you guys think that they belong um how early would you take them uh let me know what you guys are thinking on that one it, it's a big mystery because obviously no matter what those two guys you know knock on wood they don't get injured but they're going to absolutely dominate and put up a ton of points every week. So, you know, it's been a long, long time since we've seen quarterbacks get taken this early. And I don't know, it's kind of exciting. And because it's been so long sort of makes me nervous uh, as well as some other people. So last but not least, before we get out of here for this episode, we're going to talk some baseball And there's been a lot of trades recently as a trade deadline is approaching. Um, So the big one is the Padres acquired Mike Clevenger from Cleveland in a nine player deal. Now this could be really good. I was telling you guys this last week. I absolutely love the San Diego Padres. They're one of the most fun teams to watch. They, I mean, offensively they are, unreal they just hit the shit out of the ball every game they put up runs like nobody's business they're fun to watch in the field um just one of the most electric teams in baseball right now especially with Tatis but they're pitching their pitching's been good not great 
Uh, Chris Paddock is not having the year he had last year, but he's still doing really well. But Clevenger just gives them that little extra push that they need. And, you know, they're obviously thinking about the World Series here a little bit. And if he can do that for – he's been pitching well this year. So, I mean, if he can do that for them, it's a great move. Um, it should be interesting to see how he fits in this rotation and, you know, what, what the Padres can do going from here. Uh, probably the next biggest deal is that the Oakland Athletics – Got Mike Miner from the Rangers for two players. Um, Mike Miner has been on an absolute tear the last uh, last two years, three years. Uh, he's been really hard to hit. Um, he's he's a one of the not a not a huge big name pitcher for a lot of casual baseball fans, but he is really really good. And I mean, this goes back to I don't even know what episode of Bagels and Locks. You probably have to check maybe like two or three, but we discussed um, we discussed what teams we think can make the World Series. And I said, you know, the Oakland Athletics, they're always sneakily very good. Um, and in a shortened year, you never know what can happen with them. And they're one of the best teams in baseball. And with Mike Miner, they get – a lot better and really adds to their starting uh, rotation. So that's another team you want to watch out for. The Blue Jays acquired lefty Robbie Ray from the Diamondbacks. I uh, thought that deal was kind of interesting. I don't think Robbie Ray has really been too phenomenal this year. And I don't know if this is uh, really the time for Toronto to be making a push. I guess anything can happen this year. Their bats have been great, but defensively they haven't been that awesome of a team. I don't know if Robbie Ray's really helping them out too much in that department, but who knows? You know, I don't really know how much how many years are left on his contract, but next year he could be phenomenal for them. So it, it could be a great move. Also, the Marlins made a very surprising trade for the Diamondbacks Starling Marte. Um, I love that move for them. The the Marlins are, you know, everyone hates them because they were kind of you know, they were the first team to really get hit with COVID and they were really irresponsible, but they, they've been batting really well. Starling Marte is another guy you definitely just want on your team defensively and offensively. Um, just a great player. But then the Blue Jays acquired Jonathan Villar from the Marlins. So this sort of confused me that you're loading up and you're getting Marte and then you're getting rid of Jonathan Villar, who is one of their best players. So I'm kind of confused as to what Miami's doing, but, you know, people have been for years. So I guess they guess this isn't really new news for you guys. Um, none of the other trades are super huge. Um, I guess the Mets got Robinson Chirinos and Todd Frazier from the Rangers. That's pretty good. And they also got Miguel Castro from the Orioles. Um, but, I mean, they're the Mets. I mean, if you guys have ever watched baseball, you know that the Mets are just going to either suck for nine innings or be great for seven and then just lose it in the last two. It's, it's the Mets. It's just, it's just how it is. And last but not least, Cubs acquired Cameron Maben from the Tigers. I thought this was kind of surprising as the Cubs have a very, very good outfield. I guess he can fill in for a guy that needs some rest or pinch run, pinch hit in a such some situations, but uh, this this one kind of surprised me, and you got to feel for Cameron Mabin. I mean, the Tigers have traded him a couple times now. He must think we hate him. I actually like him a lot, but it was nice having you around again, Cameron Mabin. And lastly, Tigers are at 500. They got a shot of making the playoffs this year with an extended format. Uh, we're gonna have to see what happens, guys. I mean, who who knows? I don't know how competitive we'll be. You know, one day we look like shit. The next the next series. We sweep the Twins. So this this team is always surprising me. Um, but it should be interesting. And that, I think, guys, is going to do it for this week of Bagels and Locks. Got, got some more baseball in than last week. A couple of you guys complained about it. That was too heavy on the basketball, and I feel you. Also talk some fantasy football in there. If you're a hockey fan, man, I'm so sorry because it's the playoffs, and I'm pretty sure it's, like, super exciting, but... I don't know. With that sport without fans, I think, is hitting me the hardest, which is really weird. But 
it is what it is. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Bagels and Locks Pod. If you haven't already, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on Spotify. Um, and thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next week.